What time do we have? Can you type? No. What time do you have? What? Uh, 434. All right. <laughs> <laughs> the engine fix that fuck is nigh. Come save your souls and your software from the 32-bit original sin. Repent for the third of the other Phoenix Epoch is nigh. It is coming. You have but 25 years to live. Repent for the end of the Phoenix Epoch is nigh. Save your souls from the original 32-bit sin. Save your souls and your software today, good people. Good friends, I have come to spread the good news. Not quite that holy. <laughs> so, uh, I have to, my equipment, I'm not sure with the reverse magnetic field here down under whether it's going to work. I need two uh, uh, volunteers from the audience. Come, come up. Hello, how conductive are you? Okay. Here's my other one. You see behind the curtain. Another volunteer? Come, let the whole this flow through you. <laughs> All right. All right. Hold <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> up. 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 Left. Behind. <laughs> Said. Okay. Let's see if this works. <laughs> that, it's, 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 it's like that shampoo. <laughs> Makes you know it's working. Yes. Okay. Okay. Should they be feeling pain? <laughs> <laughs> Ready? <laughs> yes! <laughs> Success! You can put them down very slowly. <laughs> okay. Good. Good. Is that it? Is that's, that's, that's it, except that um, I can't see my notes now. <laughs> so let us uh, <clears throat> take a peek behind the curtain. Oops. <laughs> just, whoops, what did I just do? I'll just tell me to turn around and. <laughs> uh, Thought I had that prepared so well. Oh well, theatrics. Yes, yes, excellent. Oh, that's not it. <laughs> yes, yes. Brothers and sisters, I am here to ask you one question. Are you ready for the end of the world? Can I get an amen? Amen. Can I get a 200 okay? 200 okay. <laughs> I'm here as your soul and your software ready for the end of the world. Now you're saying to yourself, Schwern, the world ends all the time. <laughs> what do I have to worry about? The world ended in the year 2000. Nobody noticed. If you believe Jeff, the IP apocalypse is already upon us. Nobody noticed. <laughs> if you believe the Mayans, the world ended a few months ago. Nobody noticed. But last I heard, my computer doesn't run on a Mayan calendar. My computer runs on the holy, most holy Unix calendar, ticking off seconds since the beginning of time. And when did time begin, you may ask? On my birthday. <laughs> You're crazy man. <laughs> Thursday, January 1st, midnight 1970, the start of the Unix age, all one time, 32 bits for all time. 
and scientists agree. Taking away second after second, we have, in their infinite wisdom, our lords and the labs gave us 2,147,483,537 seconds. That is all, plus 100. <laughs> that is the end, that is the end of time. Bell Labs, it's all they felt that we needed, and who are we to question their wisdom? The labs work in mysterious ways. This is the end. This is the end of all time. Our original 32-bit sin, which we must wash away today in this room. And maybe thinking, Schwerin, by that time, I'll be retired. But that won't happen, not because you'll be dead or because you'll be out of money, but because your bank will think you haven't been born yet. Why? <laughs> because when the end of the world comes, we'll start all over again in 1901. We'll be reborn, and our flying cars will become no cars. <laughs> uh, the future will become the past. You might think, hey, there's still 20, 25 years to go. We can wipe away that 32-bit sin with 64-bit machines. What about all the protocols? What about all the databases? What about the binary formats and the JPEGs and the MySQLs? Will they carry the original 32 bits in at the end of time? Think about the financial crisis. <laughs> Caused by a housing bubble, a lot of people get 30 year mortgages, and the housing bubble burst in 2008. Think about it. <laughs> now you might say, Schwen. <laughs> this is ridiculous because this is all a plot on the part of the lizard people to take over the world. I say, no! Because as we know, they already have, you fools! <laughs> the original 32-bit statements of our own making! And then there's Mars! <laughs> the Martian day is 24 hours and 40 minutes long. <laughs> what will happen to the Martians in 2038? If you think, I'll go to Mars, I'll be safe from the original 32 bits in. No, the Martian year may be longer, but the same number of seconds pass. Your computers will all fail at the same time as we do. Uh, unless the Martians increase the length of their second by 2.7%, and then you get a little more time. <laughs> but what time zone are the Martians using? Well, we, we just decided that a crater on Mars, Area Zero, is going to be the prime meridian. How Earthnocentric of us. <laughs> and every time we drop a new probe on Mars, we declare a new time zone. The Mars Pathfinder is at area parent time, uh, two hours and 13 minutes, and Spirit landed at area moon time, uh, plus 11 hours and four seconds. It's already becoming crazy. We haven't even stepped foot on that planet yet. <laughs> How will the future Martians judge us for making such a mess of their time? But I'm here to spread the good news. There is hope. You can save your souls and your software from the original 32-bit sin. When the glorious rapture at the end of time crashes the heathen computers, we will be safe. Can I get an exit code zero? Exit code zero. Is there someone in the audience whose devices would like to be saved? Where is your device, sir? <laughs> How much do you value this device, sir? <laughs> I'll do a mass blessing. <laughs> Lord to the labs. Save the sitting software and these good and righteous audience. Break their bits and trains so that two become four and 32 become 64. Demons of the past, away, now and forever to the end of time. End of file. Uh, so that concludes the crazy portion of the talk. <laughs> Y'all are timid. Nobody wanted to.
Um, let's, uh, let's pull up the other half of the talk. There we go. Okay, so there is actually serious content here. Um, oh, yeah. So I want to talk to you about uh, J.R. Stockton's critical and significant dates. This is an amazing list. I love it so much. Um, it's not about your dating history, but it's about time and date values past and the future from uh, the beginning of the universe, generally considered to be a bad idea, um, <laughs> to the beginning of the Unix epoch, uh, where Unix counts the number of seconds since 1970, um, to the end of the world, and all the crazy exceptions in between. Um, <laughs> So, so what's the problem? And it turns out that in dating, and in dating, size matters. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, here's an example of, of getting the, uh, the end of time in Perl. We've got uh, 231 minus 1, and uh, that comes out as the end of the world. You add a simple, just add 1 to that. And what happens on a 32-bit machine? Well, at the time they wrote this talk five years ago, this is what would happen. Uh-oh, 1901. Whoops, gone from flying car to no car. <laughs> so uh, normally, high-level programming lets us forget that we're running hard software on actual silicon. And this is, uh, the hardware has its limits. And if you ask a C programmer, they'll say something like, oh, it's because of 32-bit unsigned double floating point static registers, or something like that. <laughs> um, but languages, high-level languages, are supposed to shield us from all that. But sometimes they don't. And of course, what's going on here is that a 32-bit uh, signed integer only has 31 bits for the integer and one for the sign. So it can store from uh, 2 billion and change to negative 2 billion and change. It's actually minus 1. Um, and we go from that to, oh, right, sorry. Were you not reading my own talk? Uh, so in 2038, 32-bit <clears throat> signed Unix time fails because that's all about a 32-bit integer can hold. But if we up it to 64 bits, well, now we get to the year, we, now we have the year uh, 292 billion problem. And that's when 64 bit signed uh, uh, time fails. If we up it to 128 bits, uh, we fail at the, we have the five non-alien problem. Um, if we go to 256 bits, we have the 1.8 million vingant alien problem. Uh, and then finally, uh, there are only 2 to the 80th particles in the universe. So in the year 2 to the 10th, the 80th is now impossible to write the year. This is, this is a hard limit. Um, but fortunately, at uh, 1 to the 36, the universe will decay, theoretically. Um, and uh, uh, we don't have to worry about the, uh, the year 1.8 million being an alien problem. Now. Uh, a Portland Pro monitor, Keith Lobstrom, um, an inventor of the Lobstrom launch, launch loop, so uh, actual rocket scientist, uh, has the complete solution. He said, why are you storing time in seconds? You should be storing time in the only sensible unit, the Planck time. <laughs> so it turns out that uh, you can store uh, 1 to the 36 years in about 266 bits, and then you're done with this problem forever. You don't have to hear about it ever again. Get on that. Um, so uh, the Planck time units since 1970, that's the approximate number that we've gone through. Um, uh, don't be tempted to use 256 bits or else you fall afoul of the uh, year 989 one. Yes, that problem. Uh, and as Keith points out, the programmer will have a lot of accumulated code to fix. <laughs> so um, oddly enough, uh, when the 2038 problem started to come up in, in Perl, uh, there were some arguments on the Perl development list about what to do about it. And it was kind of split between the, Perl pro, the native Perl programmers who don't really know C and the C programmers who know Perl. And the C programmers said, well, the GM time function, the, the function that says, hey, give me the, give me the date in, um, in GMT, internally uses the time T C structure. Uh, and time T is a signed 32-bit integer, right, on a 32-bit machine. And signed 32-bit numbers overflow at 2 to the 31st, right? And, you know, this and then that. Um, so therefore, in their mind, this made perfect sense. You got exactly what you asked for, right? You put in a 32-bit integer and you overflowed it and you get an old time. 
what's the problem? <laughs> I'm not kidding, people argued this. Uh, but this is Perl, and Perl is supposed to do what I mean, and, and I'm a Perl programmer. Um, and we don't care about 32-bit signed double floating point static registers, uh, and more importantly, my clients don't care. So when they get 1901, I can't say it's because of 32-bit signed double floating point registers and expect them to go, oh yes, okay, I understand, that's why we can't sell any products today. No, they go, you're fired! <laughs> So a number is a number. That's the, that's the deal that most languages these days sell us. A number is a number is a number. Um, I don't really care how to represent it internally, just figure it out. Um, so we had to fix this. So I, we had to fix this. Uh, I had to fix this. So why do you care, right? As I said, you know, it's 25 years to go. In 25 years, you'll be, uh, uh, well, I can only hope I look that good in 25 years. Um, you'll probably be retired, and I'll be eligible for the AARP, uh, which doesn't make any sense to you, American Retirement Program. Um, but stuff happens in the future. Right now, right now, stuff happens in the future. Um, and this might seem obvious, but a lot of people pretend it doesn't. Uh, for example, anybody here have a 30-year mortgage? Raise your hand. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> um, Perhaps you want to construct some sort of death clock. I plan on living beyond 2038. Uh, and also stuff happens in the past because uh, odds are if you have problems with 2038, you have problems with dates before 1901 or even before 1970. Um, here are some wonderful photographs of Pittsburgh in 1941, uh, in 1927, uh, 1938. Um, and uh, it turns out that apparently a, a, a few years ago, Picasso wouldn't understand a photograph that had a, a date timestamp on it before 1970. Whoops. <clears throat> um, and of course, this is, you know, most important date in my life. I was born. Uh, but some people weren't born before 1970. Maybe you'd like computers to know that. Um, Windows cannot hand neg handle negative times. At least it uh, couldn't at the, at the time I wrote this. Um, the other problem is people are a little slow to upgrade. So we know that people are still using Pro 581, and this is 10 year, released 10 years ago. Um, so we've got a 10 year upgrade cycle in Perl, or more, it's getting, it's getting longer. Um, the more critical the application, the more slower the upgrade cycle, especially in like the more money that the company has, the slower the upgrade cycle it seems to be. Um, so you kind of do the math, and you go, well, by the time they upgrade software that they're running today, we're only gonna have 15 years to go, and the problem is gonna get even worse. Um, I, found, uh, I found a great uh, one about one of the first major uh, failures to 2038 was AOL, who was storing, they, was, they, was, they were storing uh, their user data in their database and they had no way of saying never expire this. So the programmer just said, oh, well, it'll just expire in 30 years. 2008 rolls around and the system crashes because all of a sudden they've got negative dates in their, in their system and everything goes to pot. And they probably fixed it by just hard coding 2038 in it, and then it'll all fail later on. But stuff is already starting to fail because of this. So that's the problem. And before we look at solutions, I want to talk about what's not a solution. Because a lot of people think that they have things that are solutions. Blame the user. That's the good one. Um, just say, you use a 32 bit integer, you're wrong. Um, no, only C programmers think this is a feature. Um, let's all upgrade to 64 bit processors. Uh, that actually is, is working for the most part to solve the problem for the home user, because you know our, our cycle is maybe three, five years uh, for stuff. But that's not what's scary. It's the embedded systems that nobody thinks about. It's the factories, it's your car, it's your TV, it's your heating and air conditioning system, all quietly ticking away, doing its job with a computer you don't even know about. That's probably, probably not even 32-bit um, until time runs out and then who knows what happens. <clears throat> when all of a sudden it thinks it's the past. Um, we, we already had a bunch of, when daylight savings times uh, rules change, there are problems with uh, you know, factories melting down because suddenly it's the past and it doesn't know to shut itself off and overheats and spills everywhere. So really what saying, let's all upgrade to 64 bit is saying is, the, is this. <clears throat> There's also another problem. Uh, let's talk about the burning sky orb. You guys have a lot of it down here. <laughs> uh, so we really have two types of time. Uh, on the one sort of time, uh, the local time is meant to, to track the burning sky orb. 
although we do it in a crazy manner. Um, the other one says, fuck the sun, uh, UTC, and we don't have to worry about it. Um, but whether you like it or not, time zones are really important. And time zones are insane, and time zones are political. Time zones change over time, and then there's daylight savings time, which is its own bucket of suck. Um, all of this information is located in your operating system's time zone database, probably uh, held together by the people who do the Olson time zone database. Um, if you ever get a chance to read it, read it, it's funny. Um, they have lots and lots of comments about why things are certain ways and the historical versions of it. So if you're any, any, any interest in this sort of thing, it's great. Um, so it's, it's your operating system time zone database. It gets updated with the operating system. Unfortunately, there is no portable API to the operating system time zone database. And by portable, I mean, you know, not Fedora and Debian. I realize I'm at a Linux conference. I mean the pro idea of portable, which is Windows, Linux, HPUX, VMS, you know, every uh, operating system you can think of. <coughs> um, so, uh, there's no agreed upon location for it. Uh, some languages and programs work around this by shipping their own copy of this time zone database. And now you have two problems. <laughs> <laughs> because it gets, it's, it's bad enough when you have one time zone database you have to update. Now when you have, say, six of them, you don't even know where they are or what has them. You know, uh, uh, it gets worse <clears throat> because um, daylight savings time, as I mentioned, is horrifying. So it was originally uh, introduced as a joke by Benjamin Franklin in 1784 to save money on candles. Now, let's fast forward to 2005, the Energy Policy Act of 2005 in the United States. Um, let's, uh, let's change the savings time uh, by a few weeks um, to save energy. So uh, Benjamin Franklin was right. Oh my god, they just didn't understand. But they gave us one year to update all the time zone databases. One year. Uh, and then they gave themselves nine months to test its impact. Uh, and then they said, oh, we can put it all right back if we want to. <laughs> Anytime we want. Um, so uh, the scramble, at least in the US, to get all the time zone databases update, updated was, uh, was pretty bad. Um, but I can't imagine, it's bad enough when you have one, but when you, get, when you have six, seven, 10, 12, it's just gonna get worse. So, um, so to fix this problem, you need something that does this. It handles time zones, which knocks out a lot of libraries out there. It knocks out like libtai, and knocks out a whole lot of stuff. Um, has to use a system time zone database. Um, it has to be portable, and when I say portable, I mean ANSI C89. Maybe, maybe ISO 90, maybe. But that's, that's what I mean by portable. Um, it's got to have, in my, in my case, I'd have a compatible license with Perl, um, but anybody else. I mean, basically, it has to have a compatible license with everything, which pretty much means MIT or, uh, or three, three letter BSD. Um, and it has to be, you know, has an interface compatible with the existing time.t structures because that's what everybody is kind of using under the hood. Nothing. There's no, there was nothing out there at the time. Uh, this was about five years ago. Nothing. Um, so it seems impossible, except I lied. Uh, I lied about a little part. Um, there is a way, there is an interface to the system time zone database. It just sucks. That. Yeah. Uh, C89 has two functions that can talk to the time zone database, and this is the wedge that I used to fix this problem uh, of 64-bit time on 32-bit machines with time zone compatibility. Um, so basically, local time, you give it the epoch, number of seconds, and it spits back the date, the, 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 the uh, minutes, hours, seconds, day, month, year. And then NK time does the reverse, which is a much harder algorithm. You give it a date, and it spits back the uh, Unix time. Incidentally, because of time zone shifts, um, sometimes one date can have two epoch times associated with it, because sometimes there can be, say, two 1 a.m.s on a given day when the clock falls back. It's fun to test, let me tell you. Um, <clears throat> so, how do we do it? <clears throat> so, here's what I did. First step, write a 64-bit GM time. This turns out to be pretty easy. It's just a bunch of math. There's no time zones to worry about. Um, 
<coughs> uh, it's easy because writing ANSI C89 uh, as a non-C programmer is very hard. Um, but if strings aren't involved, it's fine. And there aren't many strings involved in that. So that wasn't too bad. Um, oh, I, interesting, I found an interesting one. So in the course of testing this, I, I of course, uh, needed testing numbers against uh, for various dates and times and everything else. And um, I discovered so many bugs in people's 64-bit implementations of time. The best one was this. Uh, this was on OSX 10.6. Um, so GM time, I said, it's simple. There's no database, it's just math, it's easy. How do you screw this up? So um, somewhere in the year negative uh, 2,235,476, um, because you gotta make sure it goes in both directions, uh, uh, you added, for, for, for December 30th, you added one second and suddenly it's January 1st. I can't imagine what combination of circumstances led to this bug. <laughs> huh? We're shorter that year. <laughs> yeah, yeah, years were shorter back then. Um, and it appears nowhere else, nowhere else. It's just this one specific spot. And it doesn't correspond to any you know, number of seconds, the power of two. I have no idea. No idea. I reported it as a bug and it, it seemed to have gotten fixed. Um, <laughs> The other one, uh, uh, this one, I think again on OSX, and I did it all up on OSX, so I'm going to find all the, all the best ones there. Um, that would just hang. <laughs> <laughs> For no reason I could discern. Uh, and, and it made it really hard to test the, the, the possible ranges of, you know, if, when your functions no longer return true or false, they just stop. And in C, that's really, it's really difficult to do alarms and stuff in a portable manner. Again, that number doesn't correspond to anything, that date doesn't correspond to anything that, I, that has any significance. I have no idea how you would write that bug. <laughs> drive me crazy. Er. <clears throat> um, well, I've had all sorts of other things. Uh, HPUX claimed to be 64-bit, but it would fail at 47 bits reliably. Um, so basically I found, I found a few, what I, in the end I tested a lot of operating systems. And what you, at the time, about five years ago, uh, if it said it was 64-bit, what you could really rely on was 47 bits of time, which is a lot. Uh, I think it gets you out of something like 292 million. Um, it's not bad uh, for most purposes. If you're going further than that, you really shouldn't be using the system time library. It's kind of silly, or time zones. Um, speaking of dates way in the past, found so many fun things about this. Um, <clears throat> Operating systems do different things when you go away in the past with time zones. And I had uh, a bunch of bugs in my tests where I would run them on some machines and I'd be like, okay, this is uh, uh, Europe London time zone, this is Europe Paris, they, they're in the same time zone, they should be the same. And then they would uh, somewhere in the past they would diverge by like 12 minutes. I'm like, what? So it turns out that, that um, some systems, a lot of Linux systems, um, Will, uh, when, the, when you're before time zones in history, it'll start to use solar noon in that particular city, which is really clever. Uh, <clears throat> okay, so step two. So before we can talk about step two, let's talk about calendars. It's crazy making, crazy making calendars. Before we talk about calendars, let's talk about Julius Caesar. So uh, the calendar we think of uh, uh, as the Julian calendar introduced into the West in 46 BC by Julius Caesar. Um, it estimates that a year is about 365 days, 365 and a quarter days. Uh, it introduces the idea of a leap year, but it's slightly wrong. But it's kind of close to what we use. So looking at a calendar, there's two very important attributes to understand about a calendar. Really, there's only two things you need to know about a calendar. What week, uh, what week day is the, is the first of January? What, what, way, what day does it start on? Um, so, for example, you know, 2004 starts on Thursday, and it kind of has a, has a, but if it's a leap year, it's different. So you have to also know if it's a leap year. If you know these two things about a calendar year, you have what's called an infinite calendar. So you can represent, um, you know, <coughs> all time just by having a calendar that has, you know, uh, the 14 different ones. So there's seven, seven possible starting days, uh, is a leap year every 24 years. So the Julian calendar has a 28 year cycle. Every 28 years, it just repeats itself from the point of view of the calendar stuff. Um, and you can uh, exploit that. Um, so this is the, the starting day, and then there's the days going on from it. Um, 
so given any year on the Julian calendar, you can add or subtract 28 years to get the same calendar year. Aha! Well, we can map future dates, uh, which local time can't handle, into the past to ones that they do, that local time can handle. And you can map uh, past dates to ones that are in the safe range, uh, which is 1970 to uh, 2038. Um, and then once you do that, you can now do some clever things, and, and uh, well, I'll show you the algorithm later. But that's the important thing. Aha, we can map these dates into our safe range from the past and from the future. But we don't use the Julian calendar, otherwise we'd be two weeks ahead of the sun. We use the Gregorian calendar. <clears throat> this calendar has more complex leap year rules. How many people were around the year 2000 programming? How many people got the leap year wrong at some point and forgot to add in the mod, uh, you know, mod by 200, 100? Yes. It changes the rules for leap years, so effectively you now have a 400 year cycle. And uh, that's not going to work. Um, so, we can fake it. Uh, so after a lot of staring uh, at, at this um, crazy making, uh, taking a look at the Julian, Julian calendar cycle, um, again, representing uh, the first day for every year, the green ones are all leap years. Um, so for example, here's, here's 2099, uh, uh, it starts on a Friday, yeah. Um, <clears throat> And then here's 2011, which is uh, not a leap year, right? Uh, and then where would 20, uh, 2001 go? Um, so non-leap years only add one normally, you just, so you go from uh, five to six. Uh, so there it is. So you would jump from five, six, five, six. Um, and you can kind of start to see that there's a progression there. You just kind of shift the other one and down. Uh, and it turns out that uh, if you just add 16 uh, to the year and adjust for certain exceptional, exceptional century things that I won't get into, um, it works. You now have your cycle back. So uh, I can go from yeah, five to six and three to four and one to two uh, and so on and so forth. And the important thing is I've got that cycle back. And now it, uh, it works inside the 28 year cycle. Um, as like I said, there's a little more numerology. If you want to read the source code, you can read the source code, it's not too bad. Um, so here's the basic algorithm that, I, that I'm, I'm using to solve, to allow 64-bit time on 32-bit machines. Um, you get the date in, uh, in, in Greenwich Mean Time, so that's with, with the uh, rewritten 64-bit time uh, function. Uh, and then you say, okay, what's that year? So let's say that's, uh, that's in, you know, uh, 2011, uh, sorry, uh, to 2100. Um, you map that year back to something safe with the algorithm that I just described, right? Um, you get the, uh, the, the time for that date, so you run it through time GM, which is, uh, just reverses it, so you take the time and you put in that date. So now we know that uh, the epoch time for the time that we want, but inside our safe, year, safe range. Um, and then you basically say, okay, for that time, localize it. Give me the, the local time zone date for that. And you just stick the year back on it, the original year. So you trick the computer into giving you the time zone offset for a time way in the future by shifting the year, running it through the time zone database, shifting the year back. Uh, there's some issues around the new year, there's some issues to make sure that like, you know, the time zone doesn't span a year back and forth, but that's the basic algorithm. Um, the, the more complicated algorithm accounts for all that. Uh, how well does this work? Um, time zones are always dicey because it's they're political and they change over time. Um, uh, past rules become less accurate and so on and so forth. Uh, at worst, what it really comes down to, at worst you're going to be off by an hour or two. Um, British double summertime is a pain in the ass because it, it, uh, it all changed right at about 1971. Um, so a lot of these things start to map to this two hour shift in time. So I think the worst I've ever seen is two hours off. Um, and that's better than being off by 138 years. Would you agree? <laughs> um, so uh, I wrote this all, rather than just patch it into Perl, I wrote this as a uh, portable 64-bit clean um, 
POSIX, the replacement for the POSIX time.h library, um, and dropped it into Perl. So Perl has been running this for about five years. So if you have any doubts, it's been running in production uh, uh, for a while. It works pretty well. Um, it also does some tricks uh, to basically probe your um, existing system time and, and decide how safe the system time range is and use that. So basically, if it detects, oh, you're a 64-bit machine, um, I'm just going to not use any of the shenanigans and, uh, and I'm going to just pass straight through to, to your real system code. So there's no, for a 64-bit machine, there's no problem on this. If you're using one of those broken machines that claims it as 64-bit, but is actually 40, 47 bit, it'll detect that. So it'll use a, um, a wide range and then it'll, once it gets up beyond that, it'll start to use the trick again. Um, <clears throat> there's been basically no problems with it in Perl. Um, it, you can get it here on GitHub. Um, so interesting thing is, by making it generic, now you can fix basically any C program. And that includes most programming languages and databases. Um, so we fixed Perl. This has been, as I said, it's been live for years. Um, Python could be fixed. Python has some problems with uh, uh, 2038. Um, uh, Ruby has some problems with 2038. Uh, um, I don't know anybody else. Um, now, so when you, I'm gonna pause for a second because I've just been talking at 10 minutes left. Um, any, any questions or comments at this point? Yeah. Yeah, the, the, the comment is the, the, uh, the GM time bugs in, in OSX could have been because they cheated and used some floating point math. That's entirely possible because, you know, they're kind of like, at that point they were sort of layering the POSIX layer on top of older stuff and who knows. Was there another question? Um, do, you ha do you handle or have to worry about the Julian to Gregorian switch? Oh God! Do I handle the, Do I handle the Julian to Gregorian switch? Uh, no. Switches. Switches. Yes. No. Uh, so what you're referring to, of course, is that you know various uh, nations switch to uh, the Gregorian calendar at different times. Some of them switched back. I believe it's the Swedes that switched over for four years and decided that was a bad idea and switched back. Um, no, I do not, because the um, well, because the uh, time dot H has nothing to say about. Gregorian and Julian calendars because it's out of their normal range. I did run in those to some interesting problems that I'll, that I'll show you with year zero. Um, but yeah, was there a question? Uh, yeah, look, I don't know why we're spending all this time and fuss and effort because we know that Doctor Who <laughs> runs Linux in the TARDIS, right? So <laughs> this problem will have been solved. Well, this problem, this problem will have been will solved. But um, if, so part of the reason that I'm, I want to give this talk here is because you're all Linux developers. And as I said, this is not just about 64-bit machine upgrades. It's not just about you know, writing 64-bit versions of system calls. There's also protocols, network protocols, that hard code a 32-bit timestamp. There are file formats, I believe JPEG, hard codes a 32-bit timestamp. Um, there are file systems, FAT32, hard codes a 32-bit file stamp. None of this stuff will work in 2038, and it's gonna to start to fail as we get closer and closer to it. So basically, what I'm asking you ultimately is as you're, as you're working on whatever it is you work on, when you encounter something that has a 32-bit timestamp, um, think about it and change it or patch it or, or raise a bug or do something um, in it because those protocols are really the hard things to get rid of. As Jeff has told us, Protocols are the hard thing to change. Hardware is easy, software is relatively easy, but protocols, oh God. Um, I had wanted to add something to the calendar wiki uh, about this, but I didn't have the time, unfortunately. Um, I'm gonna press on a little bit because there's some extra stuff I wanna talk about. Um, uh, so uh, interesting things happen when you, when you punch through the, the 2038 barrier. Uh, the struct in which C stores the year is defined to be an integer, and so on 32-bit machines, this leads to the year two billion bug. Um, and I actually found some 64-bit uh, Linux implementations that forgot to upgrade uh, the size of the year. They still had those 32 bits. Um, a lot of them missed this. Um, Windows C functions uh, fail at year 3001. I have no idea why. HPUX fails at the year 10,000. Um, 
And the opposite direction may be your zero problem that I alluded to. So uh, if you ask a historian, there is no year zero. Uh, they do this. Um, there's 1 BC and you go straight to 1 AD. And historians are fine with this because they still do all their work on scrolls. <laughs> Uh, and being a year off isn't too important. Uh, and it's also why year 2001 was the real millennium and you had all those people like that, whatever. So if math and computers, discontinuity is really difficult and that sucks. So the Gregorian calendar says, nope, there's no year zero. Uh, ISO 8601, the international date standard says, uh, <laughs> says they shall be used only by the mutual agreement of the partners in the information exchange, which means, I, I don't know, you figure it out. <laughs> Um, yeah, so, uh, so and then they actually had this, they had this covered. What is the year negative two in ISO? It is the second year before the year zero, which we defined <laughs> by the we, we undefined. Um, so simple. Turns out astronomers, this, astronomers have it, have it figured out. Um, they're the only people who really need to worry about really long dates and do a lot of math, where one, being one off is a problem. So they count like this, it's just one, and then one BC is zero, and negative one is, is two BC. So that's what, I, that's what I picked, that's what I had to do, because time that age says nothing about this. I had to have some sort of uh, decision on it. Um, step three is profit. Uh, so this was all written under a grant by the Pearl Foundation. Um, uh, it was a lot of work. I would have, would have been better just being a barista, even in the US. Um, um, so they funded my projects, and uh, Mariah and Brand uh, did all the work to integrate it into Perl. Um, as I said, it's, the code is available here. I'm not a C programmer, it needs work. I would like to implement more of time.h. Basically at this point I just have uh, maybe six or seven functions uh, that I needed. Um, if there are other projects out there that feel that they would want to adapt this, um, then uh, I would love to hear from you. Um, Python needs more than I've got, and so on and so forth. So then there's a lot of C programmers in the audience. I'd love to hear from you. Um, I'm very liberal with commit bits. So uh, that's all I have to say. Thank you. Any questions? No? Was, was that a timid one right there? No? Okay, Michael, thank you for the speech. Another one, yay! It's a gift from Linux Australia and the conference organizers. Great, thank you very much.